G'day and welcome to another episode of the Andrew Price Podcast, the podcast for serious artists. Today, I am joined by Arendelle. Arendelle, if you don't know, is a senior procedural artist at Unity and also a YouTuber creating tutorials on geometry nodes, simulation nodes, and all things procedural. You may have already seen Aaron's work on this splash screen of Blender 2.93. It was the uh, the flowers sitting in the sunlight that was made entirely using geometry nodes, which was the new feature of the time. Uh, Aaron just launched a new three-part course for learning simulation nodes in Blender and I have tried it myself and it is great and has generously given all of you a 50% coupon code. You just have to type in Blender Guru, no spaces at checkout and you can get that. Calling it out at the start there because it's uh, mentioned way later in the podcast. Um, in this podcast, we talk about how Aaron got started in 3D, why maths and programming was actually a challenge earlier on in Aaron's life, but why it all clicked with Blender. We also talk about AI, of course, and whether that might help or hurt in the future. Aaron's advice for getting started in geometry nodes if you've been wanting to, but you find it daunting. Knowing when to use procedural versus manual, and also what Aaron does at Unity, which is Aaron's full time job, believe it or not. So, without further ado, here is a wide ranging conversation with Aaron Dale. All right, Aaron Dale, do you want to maybe start by telling us how you got started in 3D? Sure, sure. Uh, so, I started when I was pretty young. I have an older brother who's five years older than me. And he was always into like art and technology, like resistant materials at school. Um, and he, when I was at primary school, so I was nine, 10, 11, he brought home uh, Photoshop six, I think, like not CS six, like six, and Pro Desktop 2000i, which was uh, a piece of CAD modeling software. And I thought these were magical um, growing up, so. I always wanted to make stuff. I was like a very compulsive maker. And then suddenly finding that I could make anything like with no material limitations was just crazy. So I got into doing like a lot of CAD stuff and making, it's kind of like Fusion 360 for kids these days, but uh, it was back then. Um, and then, yeah, I had a friend who, he went on to work for Facebook Meta actually, but at the time we were at primary school together and he was like really into coding like doing DOS prompt stuff as a kid. And then when we joined secondary school, uh, we, we wanted to make a game together. I was still using CAD tools, which obviously they don't produce meshes you can put into a game. And then he was, he was learning Unity and he showed me Blender. And I was like, oh, good Lord. Like this is the most incredible thing because CAD software, if you're not familiar with it, you work with surfaces and splines and everything is like you have really nice booleans, but the actual workflow is a lot more uh, abstract. Like you are putting in numbers for where you want stuff to be rather than just moving a vertex. Mm. So it was incredible to find okay. that you can actually okay. just push a mesh around. Um, and then Andrew obviously found your tutorials pretty quickly back then. This was like 2008, 2009. So way back on your old Blender Guru really? website. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember yeah, following cool. like uh, like a tire making a wheel tutorial. Um, and you had like a bunch of a that bunch of That was my very stuff. first one. Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, that was that was the first one I took. <laughs> my first ever yeah. tutorial. Wow. Fantastic. No way. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I've been following you for a long like, Sorry. So how old were you at this years? time? Oh, man. 13? Yeah. I want to say. So yeah, I'm 20, 28 now. Eight, so Blender, you said 18? Uh, 13, one, three. Okay. Yeah. So I've been oh, using wow. Blender yeah, for yeah, more okay. than half my life yeah. now, which is kind of crazy, but it became like such an identity thing for me, that I think. Wild. Cause it was just like, oh, you want to express yourself. You want to make an image. You want to make art. You want to create something that you can then draw over later or whatever that might be. Like that was always Blender for me. Um, and then when I finished secondary school, mm -hmm. I went to university to study computer visualization with animation and I dropped out so fast. I just did not like the reality of like the formal 3D really? education. And they were like, you got to learn Python, you got to learn systems and formatting and you got to learn all of this stuff for VFX oh, and visualization. Really? 
and I was just like not interested I just want to make art um so yeah I dropped out of that and was like never no touching way. a computer again wow. I never want to do anything with it I'm giving up on blender I'm giving up on everything and I went and retrained as a cabinet maker so I was then just working with wood like that wow. was just my thing at that point which was great um it was a nice little holiday I uh yeah I have like a proper <laughs> furniture making <laughs> qualification and we were building like all of this fine furniture for there's a place in the UK called the Cotswolds uh, it's where run like London bankers okay. have second homes in the Cotswolds it's a really lovely part of the country and we'd make furniture wow. for people who I don't know they'd they buy a, a rundown mansion for like three million and then they'd put 10 million into doing it up and you'd just be making these like weird bits of furniture for them um I remember once we did like this it was like a beach hut style furniture but it was all in like the mid it was like a tv room playroom in the middle of this house like a massive mansion with these beautiful oak floors and then we just had to do one room that was just like reclaimed timber it was it was very strange clearly the mind of like a rich person but a very Whoa, different direction that's wild and then after a while i was like actually instead of making this i should design this so i went to university to study interior design instead um and then during that course i started getting back into visualization for architectural visualization because all of my schemes uh, i had to mm -hmm. make images of them somehow i had to show them off so i was like oh well i know blender so i'm gonna make all of my interior scenes and all of my visualization in blender and i basically relearned blender at that point this was like 20 uh 17 to 20 i did that course so graduating into the pandemic hmm. so there were no interior design jobs one of my mates was like oh do you want to work in this <laughs> tv commercial with me you know blender um and then I basically just stayed in 3D at that point. So I did freelancing for a while, got really into proceduralism. I'm not, yeah, I mean, proceduralism is such a, it's just such a different way of working. I think that's, it's really alluring as well, because you can start, rather than needing to come up with a really beautiful thing that you polish and you make it become something, you can start thinking of things in terms mm -hmm. of rules and relationships, which is a very different way of thinking mm. about your 3D model or your environment, but you can create things. I don't know. It's just, I'm trying to like put this into words now. It's like if you build a gun and you're making the mesh of a gun, that is mm. one experience where you're just making the explicit thing. You've designed it, you know what it wants to look like and you put it together and that's what it is. When you're doing it based on rules and relationships, you have to really understand the formation of that object. And then it also means that mm. later on, you can just swap parts out and it's always gonna work. You can swap a silencer for a muzzle mm. brake or two different scopes or whatever that is. But then, you know, extrapolate that to entire buildings or uh, things like this. I was, I think the first time I did proceduralism, or well, like when I, what really got me into it, I was, working I, I interned with a, a retail design company in Manchester and I was designing mm. uh, kiosks for the that go up in the middle of shopping malls so you know when people want to sell you car right. insurance from a kiosk and oh yeah yes. so we had these layouts that were like you got to make something it's uh, a certain, it's based on the number of units uh, like like cupboard units um, that they're going to place around this kiosk and you would have like a certain number. So it would be like a two by six kiosk or a five by eight kiosk. And it would be in terms of the number of cabinets. And as I was putting these together and I was like, oh, I have to put together like 10 different options and pick one of them. And then I sort of realized like if I could just randomize this on a computer, then I could generate all of the permutations. And then I could use my brain as a human, as a designer to pick the one that I like the look of. So using a computer mm. to do like the reductive reasoning where it knows everything and can filter down and then using my brain as like associative reasoning of being like, well, I like this one. So then I'm going to think about this and then it, that's going to go to there. And you sort of, the way I think of it, like brains, human brains think forwards. So if you're going up a tree and it branches mm. outwards, 
whereas computers think backwards. So they're starting with every option and they filter down towards a single solution. So that's interesting. I never thought yeah. of it that way. That's very if true. You're doing design yeah. stuff. Yeah. You can sort of leverage that a little bit to, to get computers to do the bits that they're really good at and get your human mind to do the bit that you're really good at. And then mm -hmm. you just sort of meet in the middle with solid options. So that was my first thing with uh, proceduralism. Um, yeah. Interesting. And so what, I was trying so to learn was that. this when geometry nodes came out that you start, that's what you meant by procedural. Oh, this was design? before. This was before. Ah, right. Yeah, I was using okay. one called Sverchok, which is a, a Python based add on oh. for Blender. It's excellent. Yes. It's not very widely used. Um, if yeah, in, in engineering and architecture, people often use one called grasshopper, which is an extension that, for yeah. Rhino, which is a CAD software. Uh, mm. it's, it's very good at what it does and it's, uh, it's been extended a lot that software. So, uh, you know, if you're building architectural stuff, you'll find a lot of people using, uh, Rhino and grasshopper, uh, Svirchok, mm, yes. I believe is I've Russian for grasshopper or cricket. So it's, oh, really? it's basically, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they basically just remade it inside blender. Um, and so that's what I was using originally that's interesting. and it's got a very now, standard oh, oh, sorry. flow, but no, sorry, you go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. sorry to cut you off. The the lag here is in incredible. <laughs> um, but the uh, it, does is Svirchok still needed now that we have geometry nodes, or does it do things that geometry nodes can't? That is a good question. It's a bit of an alternate workflow, I would say. Um, anybody who's okay familiar with computation, they'll like if you're working with programming languages you might be working with arrays of data so you can have like a list of numbers and that is just an array whereas in geometry nodes as the name suggests everything is always attached to geometry there is no concept of just like a list of vectors without it actually being like the position of points or the color of face corners something like that like it's always in the context of geometry which means you can do some really crazy things with it because you can do geometry operations on abstract data by simply like capturing it and converting it into position or something like that. Um, so you can do mm. that, which is cool, but at the same time you have other limitations where we don't have any concept of lists. Um, although that might come in the future, hopefully. So whether or not Spurchalk is still useful, I think it, I think it is, but yeah, I don't know. Got it. I, so, so as as an example I, of 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 like a list, you mean like you could take because that's something else actually. I've I've wondered is like mm -hmm. like data visualization is surprisingly yeah. hard to do in Blender, and I've always wondered like how can you take yeah like let, let's just say like a spreadsheet of data and then easily visualize it. It's not something mm -hmm. that I think you can do with geometry nodes currently, right? Is that something Svirchok would difficult. be useful? You could definitely use Svirchok for that. I mean, at that point, I would recommend using code. Ah, uh, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I always feel bad recommending people just start getting into Python, but because it is such a like an esoteric mm. workflow, you like you have to know a bunch of things to be able to do it. But you can do. I actually have a tutorial on this, like how you take a spreadsheet of data, like a CSV file, uh, comma separated values, and then you can or you can do it with JSON <laughs> as well. I know I'm just saying words to a lot of people, but you can basically take data and you can ingest it into vertices and attributes on those vertices. And then at that point, because you can do that relatively simple with simply with Python, at that point you can start processing ah. it with geometry nodes. Um, but yeah, there's no convenient right. Right. artist friendly way of doing a lot of this stuff. Like at the end of the day, you right. do often just need to know yeah. a bit of. I did want it like to I, help yourself out. I was trying to do something really basic. Oh, this was like years ago. I I found like the I made a video on it. Like the uh, the city with the most three D artists. I was curious myself, and then I'm like, I'll just make a video mm -hmm. out of it. So I had like all the data on every city in the world, like the number of studios, the number of uh, people there, according to ArtStation. And then I was like, how can I make bars like appear on like the globe map and then and it was like really complicated mm -hmm. but it was like 
so easy to just drag and move columns around, but it felt wrong. I'm like, this is so like the wrong way to do it. Like surely there's a way. And I thought like that, there's an opportunity there for a programmer to create an add on that lets you basically mm -hmm. import a spreadsheet or a CSV or something, even if you just, just dragging it into a, a text file and then convert that into something because so many, uh, news stations, uh, YouTubers that are like doing history and educational videos, they're all using Blender now. And all of them have this problem. I was talking to a, yeah. a really big one at this uh, convention a few months ago in um, Alabama. Um, and he makes like documentary videos for YouTube. Everyone would know him if I said it. Um, but yeah, he's, he's using Blender. And like every time they do it, they're using After Effects because they can't figure out how to get the data into Blender. Mm. And it's like, yeah. I wish it was easy. Oh, really? <laughs> so yeah, they're using this janky old school After Effects method that's uh, obviously not very flexible. <laughs> but anyways, a whole side tangent. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, going back a little bit, I was actually surprised when you said that uh, you mm -hmm. you you went into computers. Was it computer science? Oh no, uh, you studied three D at university. Computer animation. Computer animation. Yeah. Okay, and you dropped out because of, by the sounds of it, it, it was the Python aspect, was it? What was the reason you uh, you dropped out again? Yeah, I was really bad. I'm not, people, I, yeah, I was like okay at maths at school. I could do the maths that was taught, um, but I was learning it very much parrot style. I think people seem to think that I have like this enormous wealth of math knowledge <laughs> or like I'm a really savvy computer scientist. I am not at all. Really? Like, Wow, because I, I would have thought minds. that. I can't, I yeah, really <laughs> do not know. I think people, yeah, just learn shaders. That's what I would say to people. Learn shaders. If you're, if you're worried about not knowing maths and you want to get into proceduralism or you want to just expand your skill set to be able to use proceduralism, you're like, oh, I don't know any vector maths because it wasn't taught in school. I don't know any vector maths either. I don't, I couldn't tell you how to calculate cross product if you gave me pen and paper, I couldn't do it. But I can tell you visually what it looks like. And that's all you need to know. If you're a 3D artist or an artist of really any kind and you're wanting to start using maths, think of it in terms of Photoshop brushes. That's all the maths functions are to me. Like using a vector math length, that is your soft round brush. And if you put a threshold on it with like a compare node, now you've got a hard round brush. Or if you want something that does repeating gradients and you've got a gradient, then you can use the modulo function, um, mm. which I only found out after maybe three or four years of using it, what it actually does, which is returning the remainder after a division. But to me, it's just the thing that makes repeated gradients of a size that you tell the modulo. Like if you do modulo two, it's going to go zero, one, two, and then it's going to restart zero, one, two. So you can just just think of it like brushes. That's what I do. It's all 100% visual. And I'm just combining those visual elements into something else, which is visual, because ultimately we're artists working visually. So yeah, the maths, I'm not too hot on it. Like I can do a little bit of Python now with the help of chat GPT, mm -hmm. but I'm not like, I couldn't sit down and write you entire software. Like, and I don't know coding conventions. I just I can like, I can get by, I can read it logically, but yeah, in terms of building your own systems, I do it hundred percent visually. And I think that surprises people. I get so many messages yes, being like, oh, what me. math textbooks should I buy to get into this? <laughs> it's like, Dad, don't, don't waste your money. Interesting. So you, so you were able to learn what the, in the case of Modulo is doing just by seeing the visual output of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. You eventually infer the information mm -hmm. about what it's doing just by seeing the result of what it's doing. Yeah. Um, Blender is the best way to learn maths. If you're struggling with maths, learn to make shaders. Just literally get a plane, take your UV, uh, your, like a uh, texture coordinate node with the UV output, and then you have two gradients. You've got your X gradient and your Y gradient. You don't have to ever think about three dimensions. You only have two gradients to work with. Mm -hmm. With that, you can make any pattern and any shape you want. And mm. it's just basic maths. 
but you can just you can get a handle basically on all of proceduralism just with a, a default plane and the UV map. Hmm. That will teach you everything you need to know. True. Yeah, because that is something that I have found difficult with geometry nodes is um, like when you're dealing with like, I don't know, a vector and you've got this thing and it's like it's contributing to the result, but it's not adding anything meaningful to it yet. And I'm supposed to be able to understand mm -hmm. what does like what is this vector doing with this other vector? But because it hasn't, I don't know, there's a, a step to come before it actually contributes to the result. I, I can't actually visualize it. I'm like, <laughs> I just have to, like, if I'm following a tutorial, I just have to follow along and hope that I'll get there at the end. But I couldn't, mm -hmm. from scratch, uh, logically go through it because I don't know what those do. But as you say, if you're using material shaders you could actually visualize it in real time just focusing on one function at a time so that's interesting yeah yeah hmm. and i think i think that's the thing as well like getting into geometry nodes like i started using geometry nodes when it came out like two and a half years ago mm. with the beta versions and we had like six nodes people always ask me how i learned geometry nodes so quickly like i was just always on top of it but it's because I only learned one node at a time because they only released like one node at a time. <laughs> and then also I had all of this experience with shaders before that where it was like, oh, well, I know that if I have, I don't know, like whatever functions, I understand that that's going to do this to the value because I've seen it a hundred times. Mm. So as soon as, because it is more abstract when you're actually working on geometry, you can sort of see it a little bit, but when you're actually just working on like a flat plane and you're moving colors around, it is so quick to understand what is actually happening with those values because it's just, you can see it immediately. Mm, that's true. Wow. I have to try that now. Didn't think to do that, but yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's the same math, it's really the same math functions. As well, just <laughs> making patterns. Oh yeah. Oh, nice. <clears throat> oh, cool. Okay. Um, okay. So, that was so you had been using material shaders you had maybe a little bit of help there but then basically you've been just trying it out to see what each node does as it's been released so that you can use it yeah right got it yeah interesting i mean geometry nodes is a big thing now mm. but it's still relatively small like people if you if you if you sit down and you learn houdini right now like that's an industry standard software it can do a lot of stuff but you have such a mountain of stuff ahead of you if you just want to go and become a master at Houdini. Mm. Like that's not a one year thing, that's like a five year hardcore study thing. Mm. If you learn geometry nodes now, you could sit down and reasonably be like, you could know everything after a month. There's just, there's not that many nodes, there's not that many workflows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's still at a point now where you can become very good very fast at geometry nodes and learn to understand it very quickly. Interesting. Because I, that was actually, I'm surprised to hear you say that because I feel like looking at geometry nodes, I'm like, damn, I would need years <laughs> to understand what all these do. But you're probably right. Compared to uh, a beast like Houdini, it is relatively small. It does feel like though mm. recently, like every release, I'm looking at like, what are the new geometry nodes? And it feels like there's like a dozen with every every release. And I'm like, is there more to come? Have, have they almost finished yeah. it? I don't, <laughs> what, what do you think? Is there more to come? Oh man, no, not even close. Like the, <laughs> they, so I think part of the problem with how it is coming across at the moment is because a lot of the development at the Blender Foundation is led by the work by the Blender Studio. Mm. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but like if the Blender Studio is working on a film and they need a certain amount of tech for, for example, in the last Blender film, they wanted the uh, the facial hair and the hair for their character. And they were like, let's do this with geometry nodes. Yeah. And so that is why in geometry nodes, they pivoted and they started doing all of the hair stuff. Mm. Um, so each release recently has felt quite a lot like a pivot. Like you've got hair nodes mm. and they come up to a certain point. And then suddenly with this release, we're like, okay, simulation, that's the next thing. And then when we come to Blender 4, there's going to be like there's going to be the repeat zone, which is serial loops, and there's going to be other nodes as well being added. But yeah, as for your question, if it's nearly finished, no, <laughs> I, no, not even close. There's Damn. so many things which have not even been thought of yet. Like 
I really, really, really want them to work on modeling. So I want to be able to do things like, and it seems simple if you're working in edit mode to just press F and fill a hole, but right. there's no way to fill a hole in geometry notes oh. directly. Like you can build a tool to do it, but really, it's so you can't take four the points, convert them to vertices yeah. and then fill it with a face. Mm -mm. That's wild. No. Damn. What you'd have to do is you'd have to make other geometry and then you transfer the positions to the points that you've uh, made. And that's such a like messy. a disconnect of logic, it is. I think. It makes, yeah, exactly. I think as, you know, when you're trying to teach a learner how to do this stuff and you're like, I want, I don't want people to just follow my tutorials. I want people to work through it and then be able to build something mm. in their own project. Mm. I don't want them to be stuck making what I made with them. I want them to, you know, I want, I want to accelerate people's learnings and understanding. As soon as you come into teaching them workflows where it's like you have to do this shortcut or this hack or right. you have Round to understand way. this really esoteric thing about geometry nodes to be able to do this, then I, I feel like that's problematic. So I, I agree. I would like to see, I, I have a list on my notion of nodes that I want added. <laughs> and I think there's about a hundred. Do you, what? Which is just like my starter list. What, your starter list? Just like, that's wild. so many. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I gotta check out that list. But I'm using geometry nodes every day, so. What what, what, yeah. what are some things on the list? Like just, what, what, are the, the, what other things are you missing? Oh, pet peeve, no bisect. Like I want to be able to add edge loops. You know, when you do like shift R, add, edge loops into your geometry yeah there's no way to add edge loops like i just really want to be able to cut something uh, and then use that and then if you can fill holes then you can you know you can cut something in half the problem is like if you have to touch mesh booleans in a procedural system that's really problematic because mesh booleans are very brittle i will generously say <laughs> like they break so often if you have a, a boolean happening and your your boolean cutter just happens to line up with an edge of the mesh that it's cutting into your boolean's going to fail or it's not going to cut the internal faces or you have intersecting geometry and then you didn't really want to unionize your geometry but because you've done a, a difference operation somewhere else than you have it gets really messy really fast yeah. and often fails so if you're building geometry nodes generators where you're like oh i'm going to build something which makes you me 500 rocks but only actually 300 of your rocks have worked. That's kind of an issue. But if we had some more modeling operators where you could actually cut stuff up and you could do it in a way that we're used to in edit mode, then that workflow would suddenly become viable. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially now we have simulation loops and we're gonna be getting this repeat zone, which is a serial loop. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so simulation zones, they, are a, a loop it loops everything that is inside that zone and it does it sequentially and it does it based on the time so you just like one frame is one loop with serial loops or i think they're calling them repeat zones whatever is inside that will just repeat as many times as you tell it to and it will repeat every update so if you say six times then it will do it six times every frame Whoa. if you're playing an animation or oh, whatever that is that's okay so it's, yeah. yeah it's going to be very powerful and i'm very excited but uh, people have been talking yeah, about you gotta stop me if i'm rambling no 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 people have been just... talking about serial loops yeah. for a while what is it that that will enable you to do oh so many things it's, <laughs> there's a lot of workflows now where we're used to just you make a node group and then you just duplicate that node group 20 times in series just because That's true so for example, in simulation, if you're doing collisions between objects, you, let's say you've got three objects in a row mm -hmm. and uh, the middle one is colliding on one side and you solve that collision by moving it away. But now it's colliding with the one on the other side, so you have to solve it again. So a lot uh, of stuff like collisions or uh, you'll find this a lot with architectural workflows as well. You need multiple steps to actually solve something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that's and just, true. there's just like a lot of stuff which requires solving. There's no actual solution. It has to be solved, but like iteratively. Yeah. So you have to work towards it that way. It was even in that uh, the hero uh, blend file that came with, uh, not this release, the previous two point five, 
of like that circle of blue balls, mm -hmm. but there's a big ball and then it's making all the more like it's pushing them around. And it was like, it's one of the demo files you can download from oh, Blink.org. Yeah. And yeah, I opened it up yesterday yeah. and I Sean, was looking at Sean it. Sean made that, he did great. It's really good. But yeah, it had that exact thing. I like looked into it and it was like 10 node groups in a row <laughs> just to simulate the collisions <laughs> yeah. of this one, pushing this one, pushing this one, pushing this one. And I was like, ah, oh, that's probably what the, uh, it's probably what the loops are for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It will speed things up so much. Yeah. So on that note, um, cause that, I, I mean, I, I was, uh, dabbling with it yesterday, hitting my head against a wall. I didn't have much sleep, but I also felt like this seems mm -hmm. hard. It <laughs> seems unreasonably hard. I'm like, is it just me? So I was like talking on Twitter. Um, but yeah, one, one of the other things I realized is like, it's, it is hard to invest time into learning it when the workflow is going to change when there's a node that does that thing. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if there's a hundred odd nodes yeah, to come, definitely. if I learn this workflow that does this thing that gets around the fact that, bl that geometry nodes can't do it currently, all that's going to be redundant, I guess. Mm -hmm. At some point, at an unknown priority list. It's hard it's to say, get isn't to it? it? You know? I think, I think with a lot of these, um, a lot of the workflows. So there was a big change between 2.93 and 3.0 mm. when they completely rewrote how Geometry Nodes works. And I think that has rattled a lot of people because it's yes. like, oh, maybe it's going to completely change again. Mm. It's never going to change again. I um by I mean never say never but I would I'm confident that they're not going to change the current paradigm that they have with fields and all of it because it basically works like you can think about geometry nodes in the same way that we think about shaders okay. in terms of building the logic mm. um so it's a very like once you once you know it it's intuitive mm. the only issue is that we're we're short of nodes that would get you straight to a solution so that's what you're saying right like yeah. why learn the hack when we can just wait for the actual solution. Mm. Um, yeah, but then how I mean, long is the solution? Is we don't know. However, <laughs> yeah, and if you need to, if you need the work, like if you need the result now, <laughs> that's right, exactly. exactly. I think as well, like you're going to get into thinking about proceduralism, mm. which is its own skill set, I think, and also learning geometry knows now while it's still relatively small. I remember I was telling this to people last year, like learn geometry knows while it's small. Obviously, it's now bigger. But in 12 months, it's going to be bigger. In two years, it's going to be even bigger. Yeah. So I think learn the basics, like pick up the foundations now before it gets too confusing with all of the extra noise around it. Hmm. Um, so, and also could, a lot of those high level things that you're thinking are going to be node groups, mm. like assets, group assets. So the actual core nodes in geometry nodes, They've basically committed to all of the things that you can do with uh, like an atomic node, like a single node. That node has to be super low level. As soon as the node does multiple things, it should be multiple different nodes. Um, so when you have like the hair nodes and they're quite a high level thing being like, oh, let's make this type of hair, mm. then you can actually tab into it and it's a node group and there's all of the maths is going to be exposed inside there and you can customize it to whatever you need. Right, so, right. I, I still say learn the low level stuff because you want to be able to control it. That's true. I was thinking this yesterday, like um, it, it, in, a, in a way, it's got the same problems that Substance Designer did um, in that it's it's basically it's math. Substance Designer, for those who don't know, is just it's procedural mm -hmm. texture, texturing. Um, and they, every release, they were very good at identifying that artists found math uh, challenging <laughs> and they wanted tools that they could just <laughs> use to do very simple things. Um, and so they came out with, um, yeah, basically mm -hmm. like, I guess we would call them node groups that the, that it just comes with. So every release of substance designer, there was a bunch of new node groups that do very simple things. Oh, sorry, not simple. Like to the artist, it's simple. Like they would just have like one slider and it would just be, it would look like it's changing contrast. Mm -hmm. But then if you tab into it, you can see this whole like math chain where it's doing really complicated things to retain values and not, you know, and it's, uh, but to, to the artist, it's just one single slider. <clears throat> and that was really helpful 
to get yeah. Substance Designer off the ground because artists loved it. But if you needed to tweak it and go in there and do every single little thing, you could. Um, do you know, is that planned mm -hmm. for Blender? Are they planning to introduce like node groups with Blender? Yeah, definitely. So the, there's, I think there's, I mean, there's already the hair assets. I mean, I definitely could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that Blender now ships with default node group assets and you can, you can pull them in. I haven't actually checked the asset library recently. Maybe you have to download them separately or maybe it's an add on or something, but yeah, having the default assets with Blender as high level node groups. And like, you're so right about being able to go in and like tweak stuff if you need to, that's so important as soon as you have a little black box that does almost what you want but not quite that is so frustrating mm -hmm. and then knowing that you have to rebuild it from scratch with math nodes mm -hmm. like if you have something which is 99 percent right and you just need to go in and like just make a small adjustment that is such a huge time saver and as well like for people who are not particularly technically minded or technically inclined being able to read something that exists is a lot easier than trying to make something from scratch very much so, so if you can just yeah. you don't need to know the entire node workflow right you can just be like oh well this is too bright and there's an ad there so i'm just going to tweak that mm. and then it's like yeah you're doing so much less of the labor of it yeah and by the way you are totally right i've i've flubbed blunder does come in the asset manager it comes with uh hair node groups i thought those were like hair presets that would appear in your modifier stack but i just dragged mm. it in and it is exactly what i was talking about it's a it's a node group that does complicated <laughs> stuff with sliders so that's fantastic that's great i'm glad that's uh that's been done for hair yeah yeah i think we'll just we'll just see more and more of those come in basically. that'd be great i think that's the way it's going to be yeah over the next kind of five years that it's going to be because it's not artist friendly and mm. this is something that i talk to my art friends about a lot is how weird what we do is mm -hmm. like it's so it's so straight when you think about it it is so far from drawing in the sand with a stick or moving bits of clay around like what we're doing especially as procedural artists but even just extruding edges and building meshes the way that we do in blender it's so it's such a specialist skill it is yeah which I kind of think is problematic. Like, I think it's amazing that we have jobs and amazing that it's a uh, desired skill, but actually needing to know such ridiculous pieces of information to be able to tell the stories that you want to tell. Yeah. I just think that's a real problem. Like yeah. for a kid this day, like I want to be able to understand what a, a, I don't know, a 10 year old is drawing like you can do that very easily mm. they don't need to know any special knowledge to be able to tell whatever story they want to tell and get out whatever creativity they want yeah but as soon as true. they're like oh well i know i have to do this like whole production i have to know about lighting and i have to know about camera work mm. and i have to know about edge flow and retopology and <laughs> vector maths like all of this stuff is just ridiculous to try and yeah to try and justify that i find very difficult <laughs> yes yeah i know what you mean yeah it's uh and and some people literally like throw their hands up when they see the amount of work and go ah fuck it I'm, there's no way there's no way i can't do it you know i'm going to go yeah. back to i mean that's <laughs> why like a lot of 2d artists even though they know that 3d opens up so much more the there's this chasm mm -hmm. of just like technical knowledge that you need to dive through and wade through in order to get there so compare that with like but if yeah. i put the brush on the paper and i move it i get the result there's no there's nothing i don't have to like <laughs> use some robot arms to like manipulate another controller that's going to do it mm -hmm. it's just going to do it so i totally see that um and i I, th I will though to the credit of all the engineers who might happen to be listening <laughs> um it's gotten way better, <laughs> way better than it used to be. In fact, I would put the the success of Blender in recent years, the last five years, um, to the fact that it's just gotten so much easier. Um, the the UI, the user experience overall, yeah. 
is a lot of the defaults make more sense. There's buttons to help you understand rather than having to need no keyboard shortcuts. Um, there's, you know, you click on material preview now and it's just got a basic light setup. So you don't have to add your own lights if you don't want to. Um, there's still, there will always be so much more work that can be done, but it's definitely gotten better. Um, and then I think even like if you go to the other end, you've got games like Roblox, um, which I mean, they sound like, oh, that's a totally different thing. That's a game. But like, no, people are building things in there. Like it's a job. Some people can have um, yeah. a lot of countries. Yeah, there's people that are like literally making their income by selling and creating things in Roblox levels or <laughs> items and things. But it's a, you know, a completely different yeah. interface. And it's much more, yeah, it's like, I, I, I guess in a different way, it's like you've got Windows, right? Maybe that's Blender. You've got Linux. Maybe that's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, fucking Houdini or some like old school. And then you've got like Mac, right? <laughs> where it's like, that's more like mm -hmm. Roblox, where it's, it's very limited. You can't do everything you want to yeah. do. But the technical aspect is vastly reduced to almost nothing. Um, in fact, actually, yeah. I don't know if you saw um, like the latest, uh, what was it, GDC? Unreal announced, was it like the Fortnite editor? I don't know if it was announced or if it was already there, but oh yeah, but yeah, it's basically it's tapping the, into that like the Unreal Engine of a Fortnite thing. That's right, They're building the Fortnite experiences is that one. Yeah, and it's yeah. basically they want that. There's so many gamers who play Fortnite and they want to be able to do stuff and build their own little levels and their own little challenges, but they don't want to have to learn this very complicated Unreal Engine. Right, because it's got too much customization, too mm. much. It's too flexible. It's got too many controls. It's too open. They want to just be able to just dive straight in and do some simple things. So they've basically created this almost like I guess a dumbed down version of Unreal Engine with very simple controls, mm -hmm. much more designed for gamers and people who just want to get their feet wet. And then, obviously, over time, if they want to build a proper game in the future, they would have to learn Unreal Engine. But I guess it goes to show you, as you say, that yeah. um, 3D tools, as good as they've gotten, are still very, very complicated and too complicated for some people. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's nice to have the, the high ceiling to be able to make whatever you want and to, you know, because I, I know that I can sit down in Blender with any image and create a 3D artifact that represents that. Like I'm, but that's after what, like, 15 years mm. of working with blender mm -hmm. like that's a lot a long time to commit to learning a skill set so yeah I, but at the same time i know that i could also sit down with a pen and paper and i could draw the shapes and i could articulate that and if i guess it depends what the point of making the thing is like i really love making node graphs because it scratches that part of my brain that is like doing a Sudoku or something like that. Like it's <laughs> just mental stimulation. But then there's the part of me that is like, well, I also really want to just produce nice images for people. Mm. And that I feel like there's such a hurdle towards getting to that. So that it's like geometry nodes is probably really bad at that. Like it's, it's very time consuming to make one-off items mm. procedurally. It's, it's totally the wrong way to do it. But then if you're sculpting and they're doing all of this, then it's like, oh, you're getting, you're getting back into that esoteric knowledge of like, yeah, I just, I just want a way of kind of like, I don't know, like natural language prompting, like that kind of like that intuitive with 3D, like to be able to make stuff very naturally, very tactile, and then be able to express that in a way which is yeah, like direct to people without having to do all of the rendering and the lighting and the composition and the camera work and the yes. compositing and the yeah. color grading and everything else. It's like, oh. That's right, yeah. So many barriers there. It is. And I, I think it's, uh, to touch in to touch on AI, um, I think it's partly why that has found a totally different audience to 3D and 2D. Like the traditional mm. art station space, as everyone famously knows, hates AI for many reasons but it, uh, yeah. you can tell that and they're kind of like branded the ai art bros or whatever 
it's just a completely different audience. Mm -hmm. And there's really only a few actual artists I know. I, I, I actually, I think it's understated. <laughs> I think there's probably more more artists are using AI. They're just not talking about it, <laughs> particularly for idea generation. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, but the the AI oh, yeah. space, I think, has found a totally different audience because it could not be simpler. Like, aside from like, I mean, the only thing you have to know is how to type into a keyboard. I mean, the next, the only other step would be like, I don't mm -hmm. know, imagining with your brain hooked up to something. But like, it's that easy. Um, <laughs> and, and I can understand why. Yeah why um people would be drawn to that um because yeah it's it it's total freedom to uh and, and mm. no technical skill almost which is which is really cool yeah i think as well like with with ai prompting you still need to the the, the quality of the work that you can produce like through ai you are still limited by either luck or an art education. I think that you still want to be an artist. You still want to have a critical eye. You still want to have a good sense of design and composition and color to be able to make work through whatever means that is compelling to other people. Mm. So even if you're just prompting mid journey, like you still have to make decisions, make a series of decisions. And then if you're doing, you know, if you want something specific, then you've got to be in painting and you've got to be yes. collaging and re feeding it back in and doing paint overs and things like that. So there's, there's still, uh, there is room within AI workflows for artistry to still happen, yeah. um, which I think a lot of people forget. And I think, I think it is unfashionable to yeah. <laughs> be pro AI. <laughs> it, it is. It definitely is. But I think, yeah, there's there's no putting a lid back on that box now. No, no, that's right. It's, I was telling someone this the other day, it's like, if it was like a 50% increase in like speed of like a production workflow or something, but it had this like ethical kind of thing, people would be like, no, 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 it's not worth it. It's too risky. This is a, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's somewhere between a 10 to 100x you know, performance improvement. So like, yeah. it's not going away. Um, it's huge. And you can and already see like well. ethical like, AI models. What, a year and a half, two years? Yeah, it's it's so early in the game. Yeah. So um, it's not going away. Um, I mean, there is, you know, there's, there's arguments uh, uh, against and reasonable arguments you could make for like not using mid-journey, but it's not going to stop AI. There's, as I said, there's like ethical models yeah. now that have come out. So um, studios can just take advantage of them. Like, why not? And then they don't even have to get canceled yeah. <laughs> because of... Uh, also, the, yeah. the, the ethical side of it, I think, is kind of a weird conversation. Like, there's very little work relative to the, to the, relative to the amount of images that exist. Mm. There is very little that is actually within copyright, right? There is very little photography that is from artists who have, I, I can't remember what the exact date is, but it's something like 50 years after the artist's death or 70 years after the artist's death. Okay. It'll leave copyright. Yeah. But there's so many, so many photos, right? There's so many things that, and people are not entirely, not everybody's copywriting their images. And then you have the issue of like, what happens if somebody has done pastiche work that is not copyrighted and that ends up in the data Pas set. Pastiche? And also we're relying on AI being able to, uh, so if you're doing a pastiche of like a, a copy, if you're doing a study of somebody else's work, okay. then so you, if right. you paint a uh, painting like Rembrandt, mm. then you've, yeah, if you've done that study and you release your study of it, but that means that your study is in the training data, even if the original might not be in the training data. Mm. And we rely on the quality and the strengths of AI to be able to interpolate through the latent space, be able to work. Like if you have one image over here, another image over here, it should be able to return the one in the middle, right? So if you remove a very small, realistically, subset of the work because it's within copyright, then we can still get to that work like... We can still just interpret. We can still do. We can yes. do that. Your work might not be in the data set, but you're not so original in your work, in the way yeah. that you render images, 
in the subject type topics that you talk about in the influences that you've grown up with artistically yeah with like if you're inspired by egon sheila and uh Degar, and you're making images of like you're doing a juxtaposition in black like traditional rendering style against modern technology ai has seen egon sheila and Degar and an iphone like it can make the image that you were going to make so yes that's not to invalidate your efforts but it is I think there is just a question mark for me at least and this is somebody who doesn't fully understand how AI is actually because obviously it is a bit of a black box mm. but yeah I think there needs to be more discussion around yeah or more clarity I, I think people should be definitely empowered to take their work out of data sets or to not even have their work put in there in the first place it should be opt-in I, I agree with that on an ethical standpoint but I don't think that artists should pretend that that means that their IP would be protected mm. if it was not in the data set. That's true. Because That's true. Yeah. We use AI because it makes new images. So. Yes, that's right. And it's, it's, it's a real hairy one because obviously the whole reason we've been putting our images online is to be seen by other humans and humans have been copying other humans mm -hmm. for years. I mean, that's how all artists learned was by copying the greats before them. Um, <laughs> yeah. And even if they thought their idea was original, it's almost certainly a remix. So we were fine with that. Everyone was fine storing each other's reference images in folders on their hard drives um, mm -hmm. because we're slow. <laughs> so so the we know that if that person's storing our images on their hard drives, they're not going to be able to easily like reproduce them in any sort of speed. So I'm not gonna be put mm -hmm. out of work, but a machine can. So it's a it's yeah. it's a real hairy one of like trying to get past like what actually is copyright, like like what is law and then what is like, I just feel bad about this. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause like, it seems yeah. like, I mean, speaking- I, I think the thing- Oh, you go. The thing that makes people really disgusted with it, I think is that you have like if it was just if all of these things were completely free and open source and everybody was just using it, I think there would be less of an ethical question about it because sure individuals would be copying other people's work on a very rapid fire kind of way and it would really reduce the barrier to entry for art. But I think the thing that makes it feel horrible is that you have big, big companies harvesting artwork um, under the guise of research and then their sibling company which is run by the same people they're making millions of dollars off doing it right and i think that's the thing that like really taints it because it's like right so it is for profit and it's for profit based on data harvesting right. which is very not in the spirit of art i think mm -hmm. yeah it's true i i think it would also like i'm a little i always feel a little bit bad for the AI engineers, because everyone is sort of like, it feels as though artists are kind of brushing <laughs> over the fact that like, they've really created something, like the closest thing to magic that we've probably seen in our lifetime, that is not easy. <laughs> yeah. So like, there's all this talk about like, we made it, it was like, it's based on our data. And it's like, it wouldn't exist also if the engineers, mm -hmm. you know, didn't invest decades of their yeah. time researching it so like let's you know get, throw them a bone at least <laughs> um anyway can't remember where i was going with that but yeah it's uh it's it i think it's as, as well one. like when people when people worry about losing their jobs mm. to ai and it's like you're actually going to be losing your job potentially to a human using ai and Yes. A human who's very good at using AI tools. Yes. We're still in this situation now where everybody, there's, there is going to be a huge shakedown in the art community and in the art industry. Um, a lot of people are going to lose jobs. I think ultimately my job is going to be not done by a human or done by significantly fewer humans. Um, and that is going to be challenging for a lot of people economically as well as just in terms of your own identity as a creative. But I think, you know, like if you're watching this podcast, if you're engaging with art and tech, then you have an opportunity to 
you know, in, reinforce your security as a creative. I think there's a real inclination with a lot of creatives that I've seen to bury your head in the sand a little bit and just be like, I really don't like this. I don't understand it and I don't want to use it. Mm. And as soon as you start using it, you will realize how stupid it is. I think like... You realize not, how not what's the point it is? of view. I mean like the AI. How stupid AI is. Oh, yes. It's really not very intelligent. Yes. It can't make decisions itself. Yeah. So, you know, when you start using it, I feel... For me, I was really worried about AI. And I was really stressed about it and I was feeling a lot of like fatigue from being around it and trying to keep on top of it all the time. Um, and then as soon as I started using it and started looking at mid journey and stable diffusion and all of these, uh, all of these tools. And it's like, wow, actually this really can't, it can't do its own thing. Like it really <laughs> requires a human to direct it. That's true. And it really requires an artist to be able to decide what is of value, mm. especially if you're using this in production. Like I think looking at it as if it's magic, it is until you try and use it for a specific outcome. Yes, yes. Like if you just say, oh, I want a picture of a donut on a plate, then it will give you one and it's like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. But if you're like, I want a donut at this angle with this color icing, these numbers of sprinkles, mm -hmm. it needs to have a coffee cup in the background with this logo on it and the coffee cup wants to be a little bit taller than it's given me and I want it to have a square handle and I want the wall in the background to be yeah, good like luck. A, a middle. Yeah, turn. Like, I know. <laughs> at that point you're really working for it like <laughs> i know i know <laughs> that's not an easy prompt to come that's right i i i always feel like a little like like oh phew like like a weight is lifted off my shoulders when i actually start dabbling in ai again and realize like yeah those images that mm -hmm. you see online where it's like holy cow this ai made this image that an artist would have spent weeks on and it's amazing and it's like yeah but it's also so unpredictable so that was like lightning in a bottle mm. right they tried out just like throwing yeah. probably 500 different prompts at it and maybe even reiterating that one prompt at the end there another 100 or 200 times and they finally got this one well that was a lot mm. of time one manual effort there was also some skill of knowing how to use the prompts because that actually i mean people say there's no skill in it and you don't need a lot of skill to get a good image, but you do need a lot of skill to get a specific image. So there is actually some technical skill there. Yeah. And then the third thing is actually the cost of uh, electricity, the hardware processing time. Um, mm. And that is now actually just stacked up against doing it the old fashioned way. Because the old fashioned way is actually a lot more predictable, mm -hmm. a lot more consistent. And like I know, I mean, for yeah. Polygon, like I we're spending you know, hundreds of thousands, eh, not hundreds anymore, but a hundred thousand at least on production every month. And like, <laughs> we want to use AI. Like, why not yeah. use AI to generate the textures that go on Polygon or generate the models? And it's like, well, it's so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And the, the quality is like here or there. It's like, eh, it's not great or it's sometimes good, but it's a little bit shady in this area. And it would just be too costly to fix that one little area. It's like, screw it, we'll just take a photo. Do it the old fashioned way, yeah. you know? So that I think applies yeah. to a lot of That's areas. Thing, even when the tools get better, like even when you can do it predictably and reliably and it's repeatable, you still need uh, like a controller for that tool. You still need somebody who's making actual decisions yes. about oh, well, what textures in what lighting, what models, what, you know, what collections of things, like how are we gonna automate different things on the website like you can't just say here are ai here's polygon's website do whatever you want to it yeah like, it's still going to rely on that's people right. making creative decisions that's right it's just you're going to see more like if, if you i don't know how many people work at polygon but if in 10 years maybe you could halve the number of people that's not that those people have necessarily lost work it means that you can potentially have you know, multiple businesses starting up like Polygon or, you know, different film studios. And that, or saying, we I can, in, in that really, case, really just increase production. The, the speed of production would be faster for the same yeah, number of you people. Just we keep them all churning. on. Yeah. 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 Pro tip for artists, learn how to use your time efficiently. If you are spending time making a shader that you've already built a hundred times before, that is time not spent somewhere else more important. 
Polygon solves this by giving you access to over 5,000 assets, which are plug and play. Shaders, models, and HDRIs that are created to a reliable, consistent standard, so you don't have to waste any time fixing them. And with our new Blender add-on, you can search, download, and import assets directly into your scene from your sidebar, meaning you can keep your focus where it needs to be, which is making good art. You can try 100 assets for free by clicking the link in the description or by going to polygon, P-O-L-I-I-G-O-N.com and signing up for a free account. I think when you, when you get that kind of like productivity gain and also a cost improvement, like the, the amount of money that you spend to produce the same amount of stuff goes down, mm. it means that you're opening up storytelling to demographics who have never had an access to it before yes yeah like we have um i we see this a lot in the blender community and i see this all the time on like facebook groups and things you have a lot of people in africa and south america who maybe don't have as many resources to access things like maya or 3ds max or doing big film productions yeah. but blender is free and democratized and that means that they have a huge amount of access yeah as soon as you start being able to tell stories in a more dynamic way with more range of um access to audience as well like if you can translate things like if you you know like open ai has their uh, translation system which is ridiculously efficient and fast so if you can yeah if you can start telling your stories to people all around the world i think that's a really powerful and compelling thing and it changes the way that we do a lot of work as well like journalism for example might not need to be so text-based mm. if you can start using AI to pull a lot of the content together in a way which is still accurate if you can do it in a way which it is not hallucinating stuff. Yes, um, yes. In a way which is like disinformation, like you want to still be accurate to reality, but then you can get your story across to people in a much more compelling and a rapid fire way. Mm -hmm. If you're raising money for a specific, specific thing or whatever it might be. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know AI gets a lot of flack and there's a lot of stuff that we need to work out. Like I don't want to downplay the amount that this is going to disrupt people's lives and careers over the next few years. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think it's important to acknowledge like this is going to change the world is already changing the world yeah and there's it, what it's going to do is it's going to allow more people to have a voice within yeah. in the world across the world yeah um which i i don't know i think that's a positive it's, ultimately it is it's it's, it's, like it's, it's really huge it's and th that's something that i is definitely missed um like think about mm -hmm. the fact that you know every year there is in fact every day i think on steam there's like over a thousand games like indie games that are released. But in terms of like AAA titles, oh, there's damn. probably only a handful every year mm -hmm. that are up to AAA quality. Why is that? Well, the cost of production is astronomically high. It's just <laughs> gigabytes and gigabytes of assets <laughs> that have each been meticulously painted in substance painter and modeled and whatnot, mm -hmm. one by one, and you can put a cost on it. We, at Polygon, put costs on our assets and they are in the thousands every single time. And to create a game, you need to have <laughs> thousands of models. So that's millions, millions, millions stacked on millions and it's just unachievable. Well, what if in the future, mm -hmm. those indie developers are able to release games at a AAA quality, right? Or filmmakers, like how many big budget movies are released every year, right? There's a handful of those right? But mm. there's a whole bunch of people who are on YouTube who would want to be able to produce stories at that level, but can't currently. What if they could in the future? Um, and I think it, yeah. the other, uh, I guess the trap you kind of fall into is you go like, oh no. So those AAA games or those Hollywood things, like they wouldn't be able to compete anymore. It's like, well, no, you're, you're thinking in terms of today, but the, the quality bar is constantly moving. So they would be using the same budget that they've got to stay ahead, but doing things at a much grander, grander, grander scale. They'd be using, I don't know, stereometric, yeah. like you'd be able to watch the movie in a VR headset. That might be a whole novel thing, or it'd be an interactive experience. I don't know. There'd be whole 
it's just going to be a moving uh, a moving target. So mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's uh, it's generally almost certainly a net positive for the world. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully this ages well. When oh, yeah. people are looking back and yeah. it's like, oof, that wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I know, I know. But anyway, on that note, actually, like yesterday, <clears throat> as I was dabbling in uh, simulation nodes and banging my head against a wall, I almost went to chat GPT to go like, can you help me? But then I'm like, it can't help me. It's visual. Like nodes is visual. <laughs> it probably could. I, actually, I should try that. But like, do you th- do you think AI could help in the future with, say, geometry nodes or something like that? Hmm. I think. He, well, it's, I mean, it's tricky. I would love to say yes. Certainly, from the point of view of knowledge, yes. Okay. I mean, I. But I would say that I have learned to a very basic level to code. And my tutor is a hundred percent ChatGPT. I did not watch YouTube videos. Really? I did not use other human resources. I just asked questions of ChatGPT, and I asked it to evaluate code and tell me. But for text-based things, it's a very good feedback loop. It's very it understands it. It has a huge amount of back data, and it has access to all of the documentation, so it can cross-reference itself and it can work things out. Hmm. When it comes into visual scripting. That definitely gets a bit more confusing for it. It would need to be trained on geometry nodes. So really, you would need the Blender Foundation to release an AI model inside Blender that is like an AI wizard that helps you um, do things. And then you could be like, oh, give me a node tree that, I don't know, that makes a building that looks like this picture. And then right. it'll do its best. Right, right. I see what you mean. Do I think that's realistic? I just... Yeah, it's a bit uh, fan- fantastical, isn't it? I think it? the cost of making that model would be astronomical. It's true, yeah. it's true. Although Ton did mention they want to... Uh, I can't mm. remember what the, the thing was called. Blender, the 10-year projection of Blender. It's like the whole new rewritten version of Blender Yeah, for VR. And it's got AI capabilities. And that, that, that was a founder's vision on stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was... People, I mean, there's already AI in Blender. There's the open image denoiser that's using right. AI to that's, denoise your image. That's very true. So it's just we just small, small I steps. Think, yeah, AI doesn't necessarily mean generative AI. Mm. It can be just like a little helper tool that does one specific thing really, really well because of this enormous amount of machine learning behind mm. it. So yeah, that's people don't need to be scared of AI as like an umbrella term because that is so many that means so many things yes yeah it definitely does yep um coming back to yeah a little bit of uh your story um Mm -hmm. so you okay so you you picked up blender you dived into geometry nodes as it was released and you've just been keeping on its case like nobody else has um every time there's a new release you're trying out every node um, and you're releasing videos. So you started, when did you start your YouTube channel? Hmm. That would have been, um, well, properly for like the blender stuff. I started that in 2020. So a few years ago, um, when this was pr- pandemic, I was just finishing my degree. Um, and yeah, I was in the position of being like, there is nothing on proceduralism. Like mm. the the probably fewer than a hundred procedural Blender tutorials on YouTube, mm-hmm. and that really bothered me. Like when I was starting to learn proceduralism, I would ask, you know, like computational designers and architects on Instagram if they could give me any tips or recommendations. Mm. And pretty much like everybody was like, no, don't want to do it. Don't want to talk to you. Either if you're not a student at this university that I am. Um, Uh, doing my research at then i can't talk to you because of like the rules around sharing on like unfinished research Uh, or if i wasn't in a studio working professionally with them then they were like corporate espionage don't want you to know our secrets oh really wow it was like very high walls it felt like castle walls every time i was trying to ask people yeah so it was just it was really just me being like i 
I want to understand this better and the best way to do this is to teach it. Like just, if I can explain it to somebody, that means that I understand. So I want to do that and at the same time, I want to put out this information so that other people can learn it because I like looking at cool shit. I want other people to make cool shit. So that's my my selfish goal for teaching other people to do this stuff. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I started making some shaded tutorials and then spur chalk tutorials and then yeah, geometry nodes rolled around and it was just, it was like perfect for what I wanted to do because I was really into doing the proceduralism in Blender mm. and it was like, oh, suddenly Blender has proceduralism. So it was just, it was very well timed. And you're saying that I try out nodes on the new releases. If a, if a Blender has gone stable, I'm unlikely to use it. Hmm. Like I pretty much only live in alpha builds. So if it's stable, it's too old. Really? really? It's Holy gone cow. past its sell by date. True. <laughs> So what? It's just because I want the new stuff. Yeah. When I see people, and that means I get like one node at a time as well. Ah, so. cool, cool. What 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 is what is coming in four point There's some good stuff actually. I mean, the repeat zone is the big one, like the serial loops. Um, is that working? Yet? Is that in the alpha? Yeah. There's. I was having a look at a list. It. Yes, it is. Yeah. You, well, I don't think it's in the alpha build. There's certainly a. Um, a release you can do okay. so if you go into like the blender downloads and you scroll down to the bottom and you click on experimental and then you go into the patches then you can find specific patches for specific um experiments right. that are being done right um often these things don't end up inside blender or they get changed before they make it into the master branch but it's a good way of if you see something on the the github or if you look on the blender.chat like i follow the blender.chat website a lot which is like a mm. an irc chat which is instant chat between the developers so i can look like oh they're thinking about doing this and they're talking about this release that they've got or this idea for a node or they want to i don't know change the way um so for example recently they've been looking at including a new type of data inside geometry nodes for rotations so you'll have like rotation to quaternions, rotation to Euler, rotation to axis angle, and the conversions the other way as well. So rotation itself is going to become its own uh, data, oh, potentially. I mean, there's cool. still like the design is up in the air. Yeah. But you can kind of follow that stuff and you can follow that conversation. So you are you know the thinking of the developers mm. before you even tried the node. So that really does help That's you the with bleeding edge. stuff quickly. Cause you, yeah, damn. You <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know it before it's coded. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Okay, got it. Um, who who are the main developers behind Geometry Nodes? Uh, Hans Goody is the, just, he's done so much of this stuff. And then you've got Jacques Luke as well. Oh, of course, yeah. People might remember an add-on for Blender called Animation Nodes. Yes, yeah, that was this his. This was... Uh, it's a Python add-on. It did a lot of cool stuff. And that was Jacques. Yeah, he wrote that um, when he was quite young. Yeah. And then Blender was like, we want this. So we're going to pick him up. And then <laughs> he had to basically learn C because he had to obviously do Blender in C instead of right. Python. Right. So, wow. yeah. Mm. I mean, he's done amazing, like their whole design. And then you've got uh, Delay as well. He's leading the project management or the, True. Uh, the, yep. the product design, I guess, of Geometry Nodes. Yep. Yeah. And that's that's what's really like tying all of the dev work together is having you got you've always got to have like a project leader, program leader. Yes. To make sure that everything very follows, underrated title. Like follows a Yeah. You think the engineers are like doing the yeah, work definitely. and like they are. Like it's the coding, but then if you look at projects that are actually <laughs> successful, it's like they've usually got a uh, very good product manager behind them. Um so Dull is doing a fantastic yeah. job. Yeah. Actually, you reached out to me yesterday after my tweet and was like, what can we do? To, uh, let's jump on a call and try and learn what, what are you struggling with with simulation? Oh, really? oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, interesting. Okay. So you're, so you're on the bleeding edge. You're learning all the new stuff for anyone else. And it's a, you mentioned it's like, it's like a mental Sudoku. You, so you get this kind of like, you get some satisfaction oh, yeah. watching it all come together. It's just a game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's like I don't always have 
the I don't I don't come up with a lot of um, like projects and things. I so I have a Discord server, which I have a fairly active help channel in. Mm. So it's quite a big Discord server now. There's around seven and a half thousand people on there, and it's basically people only interested in procedural procedural workflows in Blender, which makes it a very small niche within a niche. I feel like by this point we probably have everybody in the world who is interested in this. Like it can't be that many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it means that the help channel there is really like it's such an amazing resource people come in and they're just like how do i make whatever like phone wires that go between the telephone posts mm. like that has come up like so many times and it's great to see so many different people coming in and answering that like it's very mm. wholesome mm -hmm. but at the same time like if you ever just want to try something out i think this is how coders learn a lot as well like you'll have a list of problems and you just try and try and work through the problems and a lot of the problems that people come up with in the help chat they're very basic mm, logically mm. but you still have to actually go through the process of thinking about it like i use geometry nodes every single day for you know upwards of four hours every single day for the last getting on three years so i'm pretty familiar i would say with the nodes but even something relatively basic like if someone's like oh i just want to fill a hole in my mesh it's like, well, I know how to do this. I've built no tools that do this. But every time it's like, I wonder if there's a way that I can optimize this or make this faster or come up with a different hacky solution that is a bit better than the last one. Mm, mm. And you just, it's just the familiarity as well. It's like learn by rote. Like you just do it and you do it and you do it. And then you're just going to get really good and quick at doing it. And also you get the gratification of helping somebody else with the problem. And then you had a little a little nugget of something that you could work on. There's not a whole project you can get tired of. Mm. It's just enough of one to like get your teeth into for 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's what I mean by Sudoku. It's, like, <laughs> it's a short sprint game. Yeah. And that I just find that is the best way of learning it. Like it's just, just make it fun, make it play. That's great. Where, where can people find your Discord, by the way? Um... That's a good question. I have a custom link for it. Let me find it for you. I think it's, uh, I want to say discord.gg forward slash Arendale underscore XYZ. I want to say that. Arendale underscore XYZ. Let's see if that is. But uh, other way, I'll, I'll put it in the uh, invalid invite. Right. I'll put it in the show notes so people can find it. Because um, that is a good resource. I forgot that you've got a whole uh, Discord that I'm already part of. I should be asking for help. <laughs> You are, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> um, cool. And so how you... I, no, that's a bad question. How uh, did you... No underscore, sorry. It's just Arendelle X. Oh, okay. There you go. Um, how did you get started in Unity then? I, and are you still working at Unity on the side? Yes. Uh, I think it's funny that you say on the side. Like... <laughs> Uh, it's my it's my main job technically. Really? Wow! So you're <laughs> so like, you're full time at I Unity. I thought you were like consulting. It's like okay. Oh no no no! I that's my like forty hour a week Whoa. is at Unity. I just it's a great job. It's like it's genuinely so fun. I think people think I know how to use Unity as well. I'm I'm hired <laughs> as a Blender artist. I'm hired to use geometry nodes. So I have very limited knowledge when it actually comes to using unity i sort of i understand it on a somewhat surface level i can import assets i can put materials on things i can build shaders in unity mm. but i couldn't build you a game i can't build you like a whole system in there um but yeah they hired me to do uh to build generators with geometry nodes um which is just such a cool gig like if you can make the, I think in the in the job listing when I was applying for it, it was like, make, are you interested in making the book that can be all books? And it's like that's such a good example because it's like, mm. yeah, if you can make a book generator that can make all the books, if you just think about it. It's like it can open and it can be different thicknesses and it can be a softback or a hardback and you can change the color of it. You have something which, rather than making one book, you can make ten thousand books. Yeah, like you can fill a library mm. with that one geometry nodes asset and that's just that's just super fun to to get to think about ideas like that on the daily like just how would i how would i do this and it is kind of um it's like a research-ish 
mm. job. Like I'm, I'm, I get to do a lot of blue sky, and I get to be very self-directed. My boss is um, is Bay Rate. If anybody knows Bay Rate, he built oh. Gollum's face for the Lord of the Rings, and he did like source filmmaker. I've spoken to him. He made all of the hats for Team Fortress okay. Two. Yeah, he's incredible. Yeah. He's the most just. He, yeah, he's just a wonderful person. Yeah, um, and I'm super honoured to work with him and everybody on my team at Unity. It's, uh, yeah, it feels, it's the kind of job that you like. You get up each day and you're like, wow, I can't believe I actually get to do this. Like, I get to work with these people, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I am. I'm thrilled to have my job. I think it's amazing. It's fantastic. Okay. I'm like jealous of myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And you're just working remotely. 40 hours a week and you're building stuff for the unity team like yeah. generators yeah i mean the unity team a lot of people don't realize this unity is like over seven thousand people Ooh. there's a lot of us <laughs> it's a big big company oh my god so my team is like 10 people and we're we're i think pretty like representative of a lot of teams within unity there's a lot of small packets of people doing projects and we all sort of feed into each other and we work towards the same goals ultimately but individually have sort of mini goals and, and sprints and things like that but yeah it's a big company with fingers in a lot of pies that's crazy it's, it's not just a games industry as well like unity is in so many industries mm. i remember when i was at university um when i was writing my dissertation i was looking at oh, i can't remember the name of it now of course it's like left my brain as i said that but it's like a, a way of uni using unity for architectural um feedback using it with uh i think it was for doing augmented reality visualizations of architectural projects before they're being built so that wow. you can get design feedback before you have the building right basically so that's but that's you know that's like one application of unity and that's very much not video games right and then obviously yeah. there's all of like the unity digital twin stuff which is building out environments and i believe this is for like towns and things and yeah building a digital twin of a real life place mm. virtually so that you can do things virtual simulations of that of traffic flow and yeah marketing and yeah all sorts of things That's that you crazy. can do with that so so, so what and yeah. so what are you doing for we unity have video games so well. what, what is the content that you're making for unity being used on can you say um, so at the moment it's, I'm just building, I just, I, I just play really, I just, I just play <laughs> it seems to be what I do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, there's, we've done a bunch of different projects since I started, I joined in April of last year, so I've been there just over a year now, and it's, yeah, we sort of jump around a little bit, and you have to be, I think you do have to be quite agile to work at a company like Unity, mm. it is super fun but you have to be of the mindset that you can jump from task to task based on whatever it is that you need to be doing um i've been pretty i've been lucky that all of my work has been able to be um well i say that actually i was going to say all of it has been geometry nodes but i spent several months just writing python like i built like uh python code for yeah and i had to learn python and that was a lot of chat gpt in that time but yeah there's a lot of Certainly, like at the moment, I'm building. I'm just like trying to think. Like, obviously, there's things which I can't. Like, I don't want to share secrets <laughs> from inside. But then, like, a lot of my stuff is just geometry nodes generators, where I'm building high yield assets, essentially. So yeah, there's no specific project that it's for. Like, we're not working on a a game or something at the moment. Hmm. Um, but yeah, there's there's just so many teams throughout Unity. And then a lot of us are working for internal clients. Like I'll be working for somebody doing something within Unity for somebody else within Unity um, and just kind of jumping around like oh, that. Wow. So it's that's wild. You're, yeah, it's just it's always interesting, I think. Can you... And it's very different to oh, before Unity. I was just freelancing. I was just doing like I was consulting with film studios mm -hmm. about geometry nodes and proceduralism. And then I was like going in and doing product visualization for companies and doing like just jumping around and doing like mm. final last minute crunch time in all of these different bits of work mm. and then starting at unity and it's like oh i work here forever 
like <laughs> you're not in crunch that's all cool. the time which is yeah. just a crazy way for me to be working yeah yeah it's like well i can actually like take a week to work through a problem yeah yeah that's awesome i'm glad you found that job it it's sounds great, perfect actually. having a seat is awesome and also i i would say unity is very it, it, it is uh, it actually is. they should be very happy to have you because i was going to say there must be a lot of studios mm -hmm. that are now like all right we need to use blender to build stuff and there's not many people who know it right like on twitter it's like i don't know like <laughs> no. less than five guys really that are just like always on like posting the same stuff and i'm like it's always these same five people like this is a really small group of people yeah. that understand it very well you know um so yeah, yeah, yeah. props to unity for uh, i, I get a lot of you. messages from people <laughs> yeah there's like always people wanting so either this is something that happened a couple of years ago. So, you know, Soft Image was killed off. Yes. Like people stopped using Soft Image. I can't remember what year it was. Like maybe twenty seventeen. I think mm. the end of life. But then, obviously, it worked for a few years after that. Like you had probably until like twenty 2020, twenty 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 one. Right. <laughs> you could still technically be using Soft Image. And then they had to like all of these studios suddenly were like well now we literally can't use it anymore mm. we have to go into 3ds max maya or blender this was post blender 2.8 which means that suddenly blender is viable in all of these studios and mm. so there was just yeah i had so many people so many studios basically coming to me being like can you either come and be our art lead or train our art team because we need so on, we basically have five artists that we need to learn Blender mm. to very, very quickly. So there was just a lot of people. And I think that also came from having a YouTube channel. So a lot of people Definitely. were basically looking for Blender educators. Um, I don't know if you get this in Australia, but like it was a lot of UK studios were basically coming and being like, we need somebody who can teach Blender to all of these people on our team. Mm. No, it wasn't just in like animation and games either. I had uh, architecture studios coming mm. and being like, oh, we really want to learn Blender. Can you come and teach our, like we have some interns. Can you just come and do workshops with them for Blender? Mm. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's just so, there's so much work for Blender artists. There is. I feel like. There and is. It's, it's just that there's the proportion of Blender artists that are working at a professional level is it feels very small and i think yeah i think it's just the the blender community has not traditionally been invited to eat at the same table as everybody else like with the maya and 3ds max yeah. so what we've got used to for being specifically closed off within blender what we're used to seeing in terms of quality or in terms of the scale of work is different to what professional studios are actually expecting mm, so yes i've definitely had it when i've recommended blender artists before to studios and they've had them in and it's like oh well they really didn't actually understand professional workflows like you're not just working inside blender you're working inside yeah. of like a big pipeline mm. you're potentially going to be rendering in software which is completely separate from your 3d software and you have to have all of your project management and all of your file system management and submitting in data formats and you have to know UDIMs and you have to know yeah. all of these different things, which are, I feel they feel very outside comfort zone for a lot of blender Definitely. artists. Yeah. So I, I yeah, would, I, I would agree on that, that it would be great if we that, have, that is an area I, I would say as a whole, like profession artists that use blender that want to work professionally could definitely, um, make themselves more attractive to their employer, potential employers by simply learning other software packages as well. Um, we had someone on this podcast, mm -hmm. um, Andrew Hodgson, if I remember his name, um, who worked on uh, mm. Dune of all movies. And yeah, he basically said like, that is, that should be a required skill. Like if you want to work professionally, you should be able to have at least used 3ds max for about seven days, like try a project, try building something, see what the tools are called, see how to take something from that and then put it in another piece of software because that will save the potential employer so many headaches of having to train you or having you come into the pipeline, deploy something that's just like completely breaks everything. Um, 
And he said, like, he, he gets a lot of flack when he mentions this to blender artists because they're like, no, we don't have to, <laughs> you know. Use. And it's like, we got to let go of that. Like, if you want to work professionally, you there's not one tool yeah, that does everything. So you have to be able to take mm. stuff from here and put it in here and vice versa, or you're just not going to be very effective. Yeah. And that's the thing I think with Blender is like, Blender can do a lot of stuff yeah. to a reasonable level. Yeah. Like it's, it's a really good mesh modeling software. It's really good for that. And it can do proceduralism all right. It's middling. It's better than Maya, but it's worse than Houdini. Mm. Uh, it can do texture painting. Like you can do your entire pipeline within Blender if you had to. Right. However, it's not the if you're optimal. working on a multi-million dollar project, then they're not going to be like, oh, well, cost savings, let's use Blender. <laughs> they're going to expect you to be using ZBrush for your sculpting and Substance Painter the texturing, yeah, texturing yep. and, you know, you're going to need to be integrated within this bigger pipeline. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. definitely having some kind of resources for, like, professionalizing Blender artists, mm. I think, would be really valuable. So, yeah, actually, people should go and check out Blender Bob. He does a lot of, um, a lot of his content is more aimed at professional people. Yeah working with blender yeah so he's on youtube he's by the way good blender stuff. bob yeah um very good yeah. advice uh what other actually on that note what other advice would you have for let's say a blender artist who has been seeing all the hullabaloo around geometry nodes seen some amazing stuff on twitter and linkedin <laughs> and then when they open it up they feel like they're just failing and like they can't even do a very simple basic thing and so it's very hard for them how should they learn geometry notes i'm i'm a big proponent for project based learning okay for um i think when people just sit down and they're like i just want to learn this thing mm. or i want to make i want to make something and it's like well, that something is so big like you haven't picked and that you need to scope it down. You need to pick what it is that you're making and then don't rely entirely on, don't pick something to make that relies entirely on the skill you do not have. Mm. Do it. So it's like, I say, so for geometry notes, for example, it's really good at scattering. Like that's what it was originally designed for. That was its first um, use case. If you have something where maybe you're making an environment scene, like maybe you're making a street and you can model that street, you can texture that street, you can do all of that bit yourself. Maybe you just want to position some light posts around and maybe you want to have some cables going between the light posts and the, the building walls. That is something that is a very narrow thing, right? You have two objects and you want to create cables that hang in between them. By the point that you have got to make that part that you don't know you've already made a scene like you already have a piece of art that you can look at and be like oh, i'm actually i'm pretty great already mm. and then when it comes to asking people for help on a specific project it's so much easier to say like oh well how do i how do i instantiate curves that go from two like go between two points that is a very different question to being like can I, can you teach me geometry nodes? Mm. Like if you jump on a forum and you're just like, I don't know anything about geometry nodes. Can you teach me? <laughs> yeah. You're just going to get ignored yes. or laughed out the door. Like there's nobody can help you with that, but people can be like, ah, oh, you use the instance on points node with a curve line. That's like a very different answer. I think giving yourself, like giving yourself favors in learning by scoping down the problems. Like if, if your problem cannot be asked in a simple question, then you're asking the wrong questions. Hmm. That you have the wrong problem, and you're approaching learning in in a way which doesn't actually is not actually conducive to learning. Hmm. And I think that's a problem with conventional education. In school, you expect to turn up to a lesson knowing nothing and leave after having been told everything. Whereas in the real world, when you want to learn something, you almost never start with a completely blank slate you have all of your other knowledge that you can rely on to get some way through and then you'll reach a specific hurdle and then you will solve it and then you'll reach another hurdle and you'll solve that mm. and by the time you've solved a hundred hurdles 
you'll have a pretty basic, like a pretty solid foundational understanding of the tool set. Mm. And I think as a tutorial maker, talking to a tutorial maker, I would tell our audience to stop watching tutorials because really? Interesting. tutorial jail is a real problem. Like people don't watch tutorials unless you're looking for a specific piece of information. Like use a tutorial to solve your hurdle in your project. If you're coming from absolutely zero, then following a tutorial is good like orientation. It gives you a good sense of what is possible. I don't think it's gonna teach people though. Like courses can go a bit deeper, but I still think students get in trouble if they're not critical about what it is that they're learning. And you're never gonna be critical unless you're doing it for yourself unless you're doing it on your own project. I think this is, you know, uh, it's the same with like looking at stuff. If you ask somebody to draw a bicycle from their imagination, that's then just not going to be able to do it. But if you sit somebody down and you make them draw like life drawing, observational drawing a bicycle, then they're going to learn what a bicycle looks like. And I think 3D modeling or procedural workflows are exactly the same. Like you can't just approach something blindly. You have to do it in a very concise, measured and critical way. Like if you're working through a tutorial and somebody says, we're gonna add two to this value, just pause the video and be like, well, why? Like hypothesize, why are we adding two to this? Like what do you think is gonna happen if you add three instead? Try it, see if you were correct. And if you were correct, then great. But if you weren't correct, if you, if you did something that you weren't expecting, that's even better mm. because now it's gonna, you have a sense of what you thought your understanding was, and now you have an image of what it actually res resulted in, and then you can make, you can start steering your understanding towards right. like a better clarity. So I think just being like a really critical watcher of tutorials, if you are following them. Yes. But otherwise just, yeah, project-based, go hurdle by hurdle. Yeah. And that's going to get you exactly where you want to be for your knowledge in your own projects. Interesting. It's uh, I, I definitely agree with you on being critical of tutorials. Like I, I think people don't realize until you make a tutorial, you don't realize how much is uh, potentially guesswork, you know, that is being taught as absolute <laughs> truth. Um, but like, like especially like quickly made tutorials, um, especially on like some smaller channels or something. You can tell they're just like winging it and like mm -hmm. hey, around 2.5, maybe three. <laughs> and I'm like, you're just making this up on the spot, <laughs> you know, but like everyone's following it. Like, oh, is it two? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's three. Okay. I've got to do three. It's like, no, it could be anything else, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I've, I've actually given advice to people in the past of like, sometimes you actually do need to uh, like, say somebody comes to Blender and they're like, I want to make a car. Like, like where, or, or I need to make a, I don't know, a character jumping on a trapeze and they're like swinging across a thing. And it's like, well, that's a very challenging thing. And no one has built a tutorial on that yet because they're not gonna, they're not gonna be a, a tutorial on everything that you need to learn. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to know to do stuff yourself. But that project is so challenging, you could actually quit. <laughs> you might not actually make it through if you're just starting out yeah. Blender. So you need to actually watch tutorials and go through the ropes of doing things that you don't want to do um, that are a distraction from your end goal or they feel like a distraction from your end goal because you don't have enough knowledge yet to be able to actually start uh, experimenting or piecing it together. That's always been my advice. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You're like, okay, here's an example for you, Aaron. Yesterday, what I was trying to build was a rain simulator. So a rain generator, we raindrops fall. I got that part. Oh. oh, I was very good at the rain falling. But then I wanted it to hit the ground. <laughs> and then each one of those points would, mm -hmm. it would make like five other points that would fall. Mm -hmm. Right. And I didn't know yeah. where to start. Like a point. It was like intersecting this mm. point. Like I could figure that out. I, I did your uh, your course, which we'll get to, by the way, uh, with the basketball. I could make the thing bounce. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, I don't want it to bounce, though. I want it to produce. I want it to delete and then produce. And I realized, like, mm -hmm. I no no idea. Absolutely no idea. Um, yeah. 
But then, do you feel like you could frame that question into something that's a bit more concise? Because I think also part of part of designing questions to help yourself ends up working like rubber ducking. Like, have you ever gone to ask somebody for help, but in the process of descri- describing your problem to them, worked out the solution? Yes. And just been like, mm-hmm. oh, actually, now I'm saying it out loud. I have, I have. So a I number think, of like, tweets I've there's almost a lot of made, that as well. Like when, and then I realized this, the, the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I've actually been in like recording a video for Twitter. Like, how do I? Like, I can't figure out where the button. And then I'm like, mm-hmm. and then I just stop the recording and I go, got it. <laughs> but I've been, well, I've been banging my head for like, I don't know, two hours before. But then putting it into a question. Why? Why is that? Why does that happen? Yeah. I think it's just part of like chewing over it, isn't it? It's like you, if I have to, I've got to lay out all of these pieces for somebody else to understand my problem. True. But when you do that, what, because you're so close to the problem, you're like, you're not even thinking about the problem mm. in the broader sense of it. You're not thinking about having all of these different pieces of information available to you already. Mm. You're just like, oh no, I'm stuck. So I'm stuck. Whereas as soon as you're like, oh, well, so for example, with the rain, you're like, well, I want. I know I want to have my bounce piece coming off, like making more points, mm. and I want there to be some like the velocity needs to be moving upwards or going like the points need to be going upwards after the collision. So, what bits of information do I have? Well, I've got my point, and I can detect when it collides with the floor, mm. and then separately, could you make? could you take a point and can you duplicate it? So that's one question. And then if you can duplicate it, can you give it a random velocity in a, in a positive Z direction? Because you might find that, oh, actually, I I know when it collides with the floor. Mm. So I have a yes. I have a Boolean yes when I hit the floor. And then there's a duplicate elements node, which you might or might not know about. But if, when you're like posing this question to other people, somebody could be like, oh, well, duplicate elements. And then you're like, oh, Okay, now I can build the rest of this because suddenly now I can make 15 or 20 points mm. on my point. Uh, I know that my velocity was down, so now I'm just going to give these a random velocity upwards and I'm going to simulate them with gravity. So suddenly you've made that bounce because you framed the question down to really just being the question of like, how do I duplicate points? Mm. Which is... That's interesting. I mean, I, I thought my challenge was like, I was trying to figure out like I can, I, I know that I can make a point. I could make it something happen when a point hits here, and then I was thinking I need something else to then like the object, the floor, to emit particles, but at the point of mm-hmm. the thing. And I'm like, I don't know how to make it zero in on that point to emit. But as you said, if it's like duplicating points, <laughs> yeah. it might might be easier. That's the other thing that I always I struggle with is like there's yeah. always like a hundred ways to skin this cat, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's there's always the efficient way and then like the really complicated, needlessly expensive way that I'll build it <laughs> and then go, ah, oh, damn it. But maybe that's maybe that's part of the the joy of learning. <laughs> yeah. I think as well, like once you get into that procedural mindset of being like, what actual like what is the data that I have at this point? Mm. Not nothing to do with process, nothing to do with how do I actually build it. But like, what is the raw information that I have at this instantaneous moment? And how would I then, like, and what information do I need to know to build the reaction to this that I want to happen? Because even if there's no nodes that do the exact thing that you want, if you can logically, like, pseudocode, like, when you're writing code, you can often just, like, write down the steps in English and be like, okay, well at this point it's going to do this thing and then at this point it's going to do this thing and then you're just filling in empty spaces at that point and if you find that you can't fill in one of your spaces that is when you ask the question to people like oh how do i do this bit and then i would say as well like if you're looking for geometry nodes questions and answers i would also recommend my discord just because it's yes a resource and it's always ask, active there's people in there 24 thinking that after this i'm like why didn't i yeah I, I should come there and ask my brain complex questions, questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> true yeah 
Hmm. That is that, and that that actually is like an important point. Like having having a place to ask questions because, yeah, if you if you don't have that a reliable place that you could actually get feedback mm -hmm. from, um, yeah, you will just be stuck in tutorial jail, as you say, because the moment you then jump to the project yeah. after a tutorial, it's like I still don't know what to do. You know. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of tutorials as well, they don't give you an understanding. Mm. Um, I, I think, I mean, you try and do it in yours and I try and do it in mine, but I've watched a bunch of tutorials over the years where it's like, I I have the same artifact as the tutorial maker has by the end of it. But like, I don't know why we made those decisions. No, yeah. And I think that's right. making that, like, con getting that across in a video is very is difficult and it is a skill in itself um, when you're making tutorials to like to understand what it is that you're teaching somebody yes. because you're not teaching them to make the thing that you're making no. you're teaching them to make decisions teach them to that fish. result in the thing that you're making exactly and actually knowing yeah exactly and like if if you can work out what somebody doesn't know watching your videos and then tell them those things yeah then that will be so much more like effective for their learning so I definitely think there is a place for tutorials. Yeah. Um, and like, especially if you have a whole workflow that you're not familiar with. I'm not an animator at all. Mm. But if somebody at work was like, oh, Erin, we need a walk cycle. I would just have to do it. And the way that I would do that is by following tutorials. Mm. But I think in that case, it's because I'm like, I use tutorials to borrow skills from other people. But for my own learning, I think actually putting in the hard work and doing doing the projects and talking to people about it and asking people the questions and framing those questions. I think that's really where you're going to learn the skill set that you want for yourself and assimilate that knowledge properly. Mm. Anyways, yeah, coming back, uh, I do want to touch on a little bit, speaking of tutorials and things, uh, your website, which you've just launched, I assume, right? Node Group. Tell us about that. Yes. And the course yeah, last, within last it. Last Tuesday, or well, Tuesday before. So it was, this is an idea that I've had for a little while now. Since last summer, I think I first thought about this problem. Um, yeah, so I've I've made a few courses over the years. Uh, I made them on a website called Canopy Games, which is run by one of my friends. And I also made some courses for another platform, which is for architecture, called Futurely. Uh, and they're both great platforms I definitely recommend them if you're interested um, and so the, the the motivation for making a my own platform is kind of twofold one the kind of the cold hard reason is because you can make more money if you sell them yourself yes you don't have platform commissions uh -huh, uh -huh. so that's just like that's the ugly truth of it it is but then but you also have to do your own marketing thing which originally motivated <laughs> me here yeah, you really do. There's like, it turns out there's a lot of work with running a business. <laughs> yeah. Who'd have thought? But I think like when I, when I came up with the idea for doing this, it was really just based on a hole in the market. Because if you want to sit down and learn to be a technical artist, you take a course on Udemy and you take a course over here and you take a course over on Teachable and somebody else's platform and somebody else's and you've got YouTube and you've got some books and you've got a university lecturer and it's you're very scattered and then like when i was working with futurely their course platform is for computational designers specifically within architecture you know they'll have courses made by people working at like zaha hadid architects mm. or uh, big architects like they've got real architects coming in and teaching real technical architecture skills with you know maya 3ds max and blender and I think what I, I just really wanted to make sure that there was a place for technical artists because I really love my job. I think it's amazing. And it was not easy for me to teach myself the skills to get into this career because it is a technical skill set and I'm not a particularly technical person. But I think that there should just be, you know, and I'm, I'm still working on building it with Node Group, but I want to ultimately end up in a position where somebody can say, I want to be a technical artist. I have 
basic 3D skills, I'm going to go and take this, I don't know, 10 hour series or 20 hour series, you know, maybe it's eight different courses touching on a bunch of different skills. Maybe you've got blender proceduralism. Maybe you've got some uh, Rhino and Grasshopper. Maybe you've got some Python in there. Maybe you've got some C sharp and some unity skills and some shader language and stuff like that, like a, a broad skill set. And you can take that and you can get yourself um, basically like marathon sprint your way up to a employable level mm. because I want more people to be able to walk into technical art jobs because I just think it's amazing as a as a non-technical person going into who was really into art and kind of curious about maths I don't know there, like there's so many people that I meet and I've talked to through discord or twitter where people are just like oh, I just this is amazing I've never been a creative artistic person but suddenly through geometry nodes or Spurtrock or whatever whatever else it might be, they've suddenly found that their math skills or their physics degree or whatever it is, mm. they can express that, they can visualize that visually. Mm. And that is really empowering to people. Yeah, And people come at it the other way as well. Like, like for me and loads of other people, it's like, oh, well, I learned maths because of Blender. And that's also really empowering. Like you have people coming both ways and this is kind of the intersection of like maths and art mm. in like a really fun visual light way that you can get jobs in so many different careers it's like video games and also tv and animation and um like medical journals and architecture mm -hmm. you can do so many different things with this skill set and there's just no school for technical art it's true so it's very true that was my main sort of imperative to just be like I just want to build a place for technical artists to come together hmm. have a bit of a community and be able to learn all of these skills to get into roles and so it's taken me eight months to go from huh that would be a neat idea to launching a platform that's um, great everybody is welcome you can come and sign up to the I think right now you can only actually sign up if you buy a product or join the mailing list um, but, but yes, you I've can go to three node group simulation nodes dot X, Y, Z to call it out for the people. Yes. Node group dot X, Y, Z. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so it was, um, it's basically a course website with a blog attached to it. It's it, you view the courses on the website. Um, it's not one of those where you're linked off to blender market or something. It's, it's entirely self-contained on the platform. D um, did you use teachable to yeah. host it? And if, your courses, I mean. No, actually, I've I've worked with other platforms that have used Teachable, and I have some pet peeves with it. Specifically, there's no comments under oh. videos with Teachable, and it's really important to me that students feel like they can converse with each other and share knowledge. And also, I make mistakes. Like, I am not infallible. Mm. This is something that I've noticed with these latest courses. So I did... Um, I made three courses for simulation nodes. I was on a crazy time crunch with it because I had to make it between feature lock and release of 3.6. So I had about four weeks Whoa, to make and release no way. three courses. Wow. <laughs> so it was just like a ridiculous sprint at the end. Um, That's crazy. But yeah, I'm not like, I, I am very confident about my node skill. I am less confident in my understanding of physical phenomenon like bouncing balls and things like this. So when you're like, if you go through these courses, if you notice a mistake, you can comment mm. and you can like, you can engage and build a bit of community here and be like, Oh, that I think was incorrect. And under one of the videos on the bouncing ball course, there's a few people and they've just basically gone through being like, Oh, here's how you actually like what you've done is it works visually but it's not physically accurate and here's why and here's all of the physical things. And then somebody sent me a, a blend file as well, which is like properly integrated physical, um, like the formula, which I just, I just think it's really fun. That's like crazy. I get to learn wow. because it's a community and then everybody else gets to engage as well. So that's cool. Was that the, like yes, the gravity, the course gravity right calculation? Now, yeah, basically, or, so it's to do with how I'm applying gravity to the ball. Mm. My Some of my assumptions, it gets a bit confusing, basically. As soon as you have simulation loops, there's like, you're thinking about doing stuff over time. Yes. But then I think I was like, 
I was integrating time twice because simulation itself is over time. So actually per instantaneous movement, I'm not talking, I shouldn't be talking about velocity. I should be talking about displacement because each frame something is moving huh. by a distance, yeah, not by a velocity. But that, I mean, to me, that's like, I'm still a bit vague on it. Hmm. But then reading people's comments down below, it's like, okay, yeah, there's, that makes a lot of sense, like, because you've got time being integrated here, and then you're integrating uh, your velocity against time again to get the acceleration. And it's, yeah. Oh, that's cool. I have to, so I have to find out what that, what that solution is uh, after this. Uh, but sorry, I, I, in, yeah, I, I need to do a little <laughs> video insert. Okay. Okay. Got it. <laughs> no, no. So that. Uh, so, 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 right so what, what, um, what did you host it with? Course, which is like the, sorry. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Sorry. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I go on tangents. Um, I hosted it with Kajabi. Ah, so Kajabi, Kajabi is a, an alternate platform. It's, um, that was my first ever course, actually, the architecture Academy, nature Academy. They use Kajabi like in 2000. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. it's, it is a good platform. That's great. And they, they were improving it all the time as well. Huh. And that they, I, I would almost say make a, make an account with them just so that you can experience their customer service. Hmm. I have never had customer service as good, like their live chat. You can get them any time to ask any question about anything. Whoa. And they are just fantastic. Like that they, they are how customer service should be Damn. In my opinion. they are excellent um, that is really cool but yeah it's a good platform and it's a nice little website builder they've uh, come a long way yeah i i, I had a bad experience not, with them early on because they they uh they built like this early <laughs> version of kajabi in like 2010 <laughs> and i hosted all my stuff on it and then like I, i'm not a developer yeah. so i did it all myself and i had a little bit of help but you know and then mm. they're like well we're we're uh like discontinuing that platform so you need to move it all to this new platform. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fuck. God. So and I'm like, there has to be a way I can just like keep it. And they're like, no, you got to like move it or lose it. So I just like shut it down. So I shut the whole course down. Oh, no. Yeah. I was really angry at them. But oh, I'm no, glad no. that they've, uh, <laughs> it sounds like they've come a long way. So maybe I should check them out again. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that was just for my own yeah, personal knowledge. Know. What did you use to hope it? host it? So now I know. That's cool. Um. But anyways, you, you yeah. mentioned... No, it's nice because you can get, like... It's a f <laughs> the lag is terrible. Sorry, the lag. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, just while we're talking about no group, uh, a coupon code for our listeners. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So everything... I have three courses currently, or a bundle of the, all three. Um, there's a bouncing ball course. All These are all simulation. There's one for Boyd's. Uh, Boyd's are... Uh, so if you think of like a school of fish, how they move around and interact with one another, they move and they flock and they mm. they create really beautiful patterns. Uh, so we have a course on Boyd's and it's like a it's an advanced Boyd system. So we go through collision systems and um, attractors and guide splines and predators. And then we also have an erosion system. So if anyone's interested in doing landscape erosion to make you know, like how you get like rivers and gullies and things eroding into landscapes. Mm. So we have a, a whole course on that as well. Um, I think each course, uh, the bouncing ball course is about two and a half hours. And then the uh, Boyd's and Erosion, they're about four and a half hours each. Uh, yeah, so you can grab them or you can grab the whole bundle if you want as well. If you use the coupon code BlenderGuru at checkout, you will get 50% off. So enjoy if you want to be a part of it and if you want to jump into simulation nodes while it's fresh then there you go there's a coupon code there awesome that's great i'll call that out at the start of this podcast as well so more people can uh, can hear it um yeah no that's uh, it's as as we say it's the only simulation course available really and probably like i mean there's not many tutorials on it either so it's like if you want to learn simulation nodes it's basically the place to go <laughs> Yeah, I, I will, uh, disclaimer, like I will be making some YouTube tutorials. So if you're looking at the price tag on these courses and it's like, oh, that's still a bit steep. Don't worry. Like I'm obviously like, so the thing about courses is the level of detail and kind of exposition, like how much you're talking about your thinking 
that you can go into in four and a half hours is very different from a 20 minute YouTube tutorial. Yeah, it is. So just be aware, like when I make stuff on YouTube, you're kind of scratching the surface and I've got to really simplify things. Yeah. If you want to know, like the, the value of a course is, is getting into, you know, thinking about professional workflow and thinking about how you're optimizing your things properly and like the why, the, the why of why you're doing what you're doing um, mm. can be much clearer on a course yeah so it it really is yeah, i will be like unfortunately YouTube like as as, as well. cool as youtube is like if you upload a long video like even longer than 20 minutes just like viewership just like plummets people don't want to mm. click on it it's too long but that's exactly yeah. what you need to learn a lot I, of things uh, which is a bit unfortunate so there's not a lot of yeah. incentive for youtube creators to make all like deep dives Yeah, mine are all like forty minutes, mm. like sometimes over an hour. But my oh, you you had the longest really one ever, for fourteen hours. My... <laughs> you can't upload videos that are that long anymore. Oh, they really? They will not let you. <laughs> <laughs> you snuck it in before yeah, they so like ruled it out. The last out. time anyone will ever have it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was like how to make this yeah, like flower like scene surprisingly well fully procedural. That yeah. It, the Blender 2.93 splash screen. It was that. It, that's right. Scene I recorded the whole thing. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. That's it's so funny cool. how many people have followed. They think it's a, like, I mean, absolute props to them for doing it. But people watch that tutorial, watch that video as if it's a tutorial. <laughs> and I've had like five or six people watch the full 14 hour thing and then send me their results. Whoa, it, no way. Which is just like crazy oh wow <laughs> yeah it's kind of amazing though like that's like what an education that's insane that. isn't it <laughs> my god jeez yeah cool well that's uh yeah, generally my viewership is like five minutes tops oh really <laughs> yeah that's right it's gonna say retention graph on that one's gonna be pretty severe at the start yeah <laughs> Um, I did have one final question because this was something that I think um, I've actually seen a lot of Blender artists sort of get confused on like which workflow should they be using for what? Because if you look on Twitter, you can see people making really sophisticated um, geometry nodes setups to build something. Um, like, okay, actually, let's, let's use your flower example, right? The flower shop. That you you can do it with geometry nodes, but if you were on a deadline, mm -hmm. you would never in a million years think of using geometry nodes. You would just model it, hand place or use an array oh, or something. No. Um, how do you know when to go the manual workflow or the procedural? That is very difficult. I think it depends as well what your project is for if you're able to work 100 percent within blender then you have a lot more flexibility and i think this comes back to like professionalizing workflows like people are thinking about oh well i'm i can do all of this stuff because it's all going to be just viewed in blender mm. but then they actually have to ship mm -hmm. like to it has to work in unreal engine or whatever it is like if you're working in a bigger pipeline then your thinking has to be completely different. Like you can't just build geometry node stuff forever and expect it to work on every platform. You have to know that there's going to be a handoff at some point where either you have to bake it or do something else. And at that point, it's like, well, was it worth doing it procedurally? Mm. If you only made one of something, I can guarantee it wasn't. Yeah, because it just it just wasn't. You like you can go around and make a mesh so much faster if you're just hand positioning like even if i had 200 petals to produce to, to like hand position i would still rather make a flower by hand once and be able to do it artfully mm. than try and create the procedural system that would create and that's that's the other thing as well with proceduralism it will make things perfectly mm. and you almost never want that. Yeah, you want true. some <laughs> handness in it. Yes, yes. So it's very difficult. And like, if you're just like, oh, well, I'll put a noise displacement at the end. That also Maybe can look procedural. For, um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like, I think a lot of artists going into this are like, oh, yeah, well, you just put noise on the end. 
and they don't realize that a lot of us who have seen this stuff like a lot of us who are working as technical artists professionally we can see Perlin noise a mile off mm. like I will look at your thing and be like I see fractal noise that's I, just, I know what that looks like I know how that feels you didn't hand model that that's very different from having a really intelligent system that is going to like make the edges of something look hand sculpted mm. that is like a two year research project versus just dropping a noise texture on something though mm-hmm. so when it's like choosing your workflow I think understanding where your project is going to end up is yeah. a big part of that if you're making something that is a one off then I would almost always just say make it by hand because you can be artful and intentional rather than needing to make something yeah just trying to get artful stuff into uh, geometry nodes but then you have like hybrid workflows where you're not just using yes or no right so maybe you're making um i'll just go back to the gun example a gun has like the main body and you've got the clip and you've got the stock and you've got a scope and you've got a muzzle brake you can position these things procedurally or have a system where you have like a skeleton of vertices and each vertex can instance a particular piece of a gun and then you could go in and you could hand model or sculpt really beautiful pieces of a gun Mm. and know that then you've got something that you can build up procedurally and then you know maybe you can do procedural steps in there like procedural damage where you're cutting out little nicks and chips into it um, or you're doing I don't know like ivy simulation or something like that where you just want to have a building and put ivy up the side of it I wouldn't recommend anybody drawing 500 different splines and instancing leaves manually to do that I would definitely say like oh if you have an ivy generator yeah then that's probably going to do like good enough for what you're looking for yes exactly but almost all the time when it comes to making a hero asset like if if you can do set dressing and you can do your environment work and you can fill a scene in 10 minutes with procedural tools and build your background rather than spending 10 hours a week doing Mm -hmm. that then that's a definite gain but when it comes to actually building hero assets we're still in a situation now where i'd almost always say model it by hand like the thing that you want to be artful be intentional about don't try and take the procedural shortcuts with that Mm -hmm. unless you just like unless it's just a curiosity thing like when i didn't when i've done november stuff and i do you know multiple days making a node tree with thousands of nodes the actual output of that might look fun but the the reason i did it was for the process Mm. it's for it's not for the output i think if you're doing a project because you want to learn a specific skill set then do it for the skill set if you're doing a project because you want a specific outcome at the end then use whatever skills you have that are best able to get the best result at the end of it and generally i would say if you want something to be a specific way probably modeled by hand is the best approach mm. i feel like a heathen saying that as a <laughs> but sometimes you just have to do it intentionally <laughs> yeah i know what you mean i know it's it's also like there's something alluring about um doing something efficiently even if it it's like at the end of it, you end up with this tool that like, let, let, let's say like generates a, a cabinet, right? This cabinet generator, mm-hmm. um, which is something like, I was thinking for Polygon, we were making some models for cabinets. And I originally had like this idea of like, oh, I was getting excited. Like we could build like this geometry node thing where like you could set it up so you could have a drop down of like what sort of file, or, uh, so what sort of uh, insetting it has or what sort of handle it has, and then it would like map mm-hmm. it to this thing. And then I realized that like, we only need three cabinets. <laughs> so the time it would take to build this setup <laughs> yeah. would cause, it, it would take days, days. And yet if you would just model it by hand, you'd be yeah. done in a couple of hours. So I think uh, <laughs> there, there is a bias. I think every artist has a bias towards the new, exciting, and also innovative and i think it's actually a reflection of Mm -hmm. what we see gets attention like if you go to a conference 
and they're talking about, I don't know, the new Spider-Man, Spider-Verse or something like that. They're almost certainly talking about mm. a custom tool or workflow that they invented for this thing, right? If it's uh, the Frozen talk at SIGGRAPH, they're talking about this new s vellum silver snow simulator thing that they built to you know do this thing. Mm. And so artists watching, it's like all the students that are in the audience are like, okay, this is what production is. You have this thing, you invent this tool, yeah. which does it. <laughs> so for years at Polygon, I realized we were building tools to do like one-off artists. We built like an entire pipeline around like breaking up <laughs> UVs to do this like photo scanned asset to put into Houdini and stuff just to do this thing. And, and it was like, what if we just did it by hand? We would have saved months. And so I, I actually like no yeah. joke. I came to my team and I said, this is our new motto, choose the path most boring. <laughs> because almost certainly <laughs> it is the right answer. Um, although it's exciting to think of what sort of tool you can build to do this one thing, it's almost never right in our case. Um, but I think certainly for productions, if you're making a movie and you have a, like, I don't know, it takes place in an, Egyptian town or whatever and there's you know there's going to be like a thousand ceramic pottery pots or something in there like as you say definitely a tool would would get you that thousand results faster than doing it by hand but yeah just yeah. being aware of the time to build it and then to debug it and then to QA it and then art direct it for that pipeline you have to calculate that time yeah. as well as the uh, production time. <laughs> I think I think as well, like people should, and this is something I see a lot in the Blender community, people should be open to buying tools. Mm. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel yes. every time yes. you make something. I think a lot of people seem very anti-buying. Like just don't want to, don't want to know if an add-on costs $15. <laughs> they don't want it. And it's like, you could save Days. how much are you valuing your time at yeah like if you were working for if you were doing freelance work and you're saying three hours of my time is not worth even 15 dollars mm. then i mean that's crazy you know like people at least like in the uk you'd be charging 30 35 40 50 pounds an hour potentially as like a senior artist if you're saying that you can't you know pay 50 quid and save yourself 10 hours Mm. That sounds like a really, really good deal to me. Yeah, I think in the Blender community, we have a there's a lot of um, mentality around being like, "Oh, Blender's free, therefore everything should be free," and I'm not willing to. Yeah, like my time is more. I yeah, my money is more valuable than my time, mm. and I don't think that's true. Like, you have a finite number of heartbeats. The only <laughs> thing of value to you that is measurable yeah. is your heartbeats, mm. and. So you, that's what you should be invested in protecting, mm. in, in my opinion. Definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. It, if you need an IV generator, buy, buy one. one. If you need a rain generator, buy one. Buy one. Exactly. It's just going to be like five dollars. Exactly. I know. I did actually buy a rain generator, just to see how it worked, and then I opened it up and went like, "Oh my god, was there's it, like a thousand nodes was in it here." Baggers? Yeah, it was baggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I then really, I'm like, I can't figure it. Yeah, yeah, it bag is incredible. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. <laughs> it looked it looked complex, but it was also like I was hoping there was gonna be like some neat little package that I could figure out how it worked, but I'm like, ah. <laughs> eh. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. Good times. That's how you know it's good. Yes. It's, uh, that's true. Protecting his IP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. By burying it. <laughs> um <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, we gave out the name of your uh, website where people can get your course. That's nodegroup.xyz. Uh, people can find you in Discord, discord.gg forward slash Arendelle XYZ. Is that correct? Arendelle XYZ. Okay, yes. excellent. And where can people find you? Where else can they find you? On YouTube, etc. Yes, you can find me on YouTube, which is just Arendelle. You can find me on Twitter, Arendelle underscore xyz uh you can find me on threads now as well Ooh. the new instagram Ooh. twitter killer yeah. uh, <laughs> we'll see which is it's <laughs> erindale but it's got a full stop between each letter uh, which is the same as my instagram um, awesome yeah interesting time for twitter 
at the moment. So. Yeah, we'll see what uh, see what happens there. But I'm also skeptical of Facebook pulling this off. I'm like, eh, I don't know. You got everything working against you. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Aaron. That was uh, that was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs>